North has demonstrated a longstanding commitment to advancing U.S. national security and values through her military service and position on the Armed Services Committee. It's a pleasure to be joined by Senator Scott, who serves also as a ranking member of the Banking Committee, which is where he is now, uh, of which I sit on as well, as Senator Ricketts, who served as governor of Nebraska. We look forward to working with uh, all of our new colleagues on China and other critical issues the United States faces around the world, and we warmly welcome them to the committee. Uh, inside the barbed wires fences of China's concentration camps, guards force Uyghur detainees to sing patriotic songs praising Xi Jinping to drown out screams from torture, rape, and forced sterilizations. Show them, quote, absolutely no mercy, she said in a secret speech which was leaked to the New York Times. For many years, Chinese leaders' focus was directed inward, but that is no longer the case as we saw with the recent spy balloon passing over the United States, a blatant violation of our sovereignty by a country that claims to be a responsible actor. Either this was a huge mistake by some entity within the Chinese government, or it was a test of our resolve by Xi. If it was, he got a clear answer. Whether it was the cancellation of Secretary Blinken's bilateral visit to Beijing, or the debris recovered from the bottom of the Atlantic, the U.S. response should settle any question of our resolve to stand up to such brazen violations of our sovereignty. We responded with strength, and I believe that is the way you deal with Xi. We have to remain vigilant because Beijing is reaching beyond its borders, spreading authoritarian values by exporting high-tech surveillance tools to any dictator that wants them, wielding influence at international institutions like the United Nations so Xi can block debate on critical issues and avoid scrutiny. And China has made huge financial investments across the world, from ports in Sri Lanka to railroads in Kenya to bridges management and logistics in the Panama Canal, each adding to Xi's leverage over nations who find themselves heavily indebted to China and unable to push back on Beijing's demands. This puts pressure on countries committed to democracy, like Lithuania, when they took steps to deepen their unofficial relationship with Taiwan. And we think about our own posture in the world, we must recognize that China has also invested heavily in proactive diplomacy. China now has more diplomatic posts than any other country. Chinese diplomats are on the ground, making the case for China's values, pushing for Chinese investment, and the United States isn't keeping up. While China is pouring money into Africa, for example, we've got a 40% vacancy rate at our embassy in Niger, and chronic staffing shortfalls from Mali to Mauritania to Chad. So Secretary uh, Sherman, uh, Secretary Sherman and Dr. Ratner, let me be clear. I am planning a robust agenda in Congress, uh, in this particular Congress, and China will be a big part of it. Uh, I've had conversations with the ranking member of working together to come together, which I think we will, on a comprehensive China legislation. Today, I released a detailed 46-page majority staff committee report outlining what needs to happen to realize the administration's vision for the Indo-Pacific. But I'll give you the short version. The China challenge affects every region in the world, and you're going to have to do a better job of resourcing these efforts. That means more people in our embassies, it means modernizing the way we do business. It means offering an alternative to China. And Secretary Sherman, since the buck stops with you on China in the State Department, I want to hear what you believe need to do to ensure that happens. We appreciate your appearing before us today. I will note that the Secretary will have a hard stop at about 11.15 because uh, the leadership decided to hold a all-members briefing at 11.30, and she needs to be there for that, so we will get to as many questions as we can. I'm looking for a full and frank assessment of what the administration is doing well and what it needs to do better. I applaud the passage last year of the CHIPS Act and the Inflation Reduction Act, although I was disappointed that ultimately the legislation did not include the Senate passed Strategic Competition Act that Ranking Member Risch and I authored with so many members of this committee. I look forward to working with my colleagues to reintroduce and expand upon that legislation this Congress. 
These efforts to secure our supply chains and increase our domestic competitiveness are critical for American families' bottom line. But when it comes to our global competition, right now, China has the upper hand. I am pleased that in contrast to the last administration, you're working to shore up allies and partners. This is difficult and essential work. But if we are serious about this competition with China, the State Department needs to be more ambitious. The Biden administration needs to be more ambitious. We here in Congress want to do more. And right now, we've got something in Congress unheard of in today's Washington, which on this issue is bipartisan consensus. I hope you won't squander it. Because while you've laid out a compelling vision on paper for what we need to do, it doesn't seem to me that we have an equally ambitious resourcing strategy to make it happen. The State Department you inherited is simply not postured for a global competition with China. And it's harder for us to argue for more resources or authorities if you're not out there arguing for more yourselves. The United States has to step up and defend democratic values, not just the might of our military, but the power of our diplomatic persuasion. And I expect you to make the Senate, and this committee in particular, a partner in this effort. With that, let me turn to the ranking member for his opening remarks. Well, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. As we all know, for a long time, the China challenge was foremost on our minds. And of course, along came the Ukraine war, which presents uh, new challenges. Uh, but having said that, we can't take our eye off the ball either, since China is, I think we all agree, the challenge of the 21st century. Well, this hearing was planned before the unfortunate Chinese uh, spy balloon flyover last, last week's episode highlights just how important addressing this competition really is. China messed up publicly, but this only highlights what it has been doing behind the scenes for years. Every country around the world should take note because the Chinese will do this to other countries also. Secretary Blinken's trip postponement was a good step, but I hope, uh, Deputy uh, Sherman, that you will shed more light on where we go from here. This was an egregious assault on U.S. sovereignty, and obviously uh, it uh, requires a response, and it requires uh, a plan going forward. Another note, uh, uh, I am concerned that the administration still does not consider Congress a true partner on China, I believe. I've heard about, I've heard about a lot of briefings and phone calls from reporters and think tanks since last week regarding the balloon, balloon incident, but the outreach to the Hill was slow and sloppy at best. I have said for years that we, Republicans and Democrats, the executive and legislative branch, have to work together if we are going to confront what China is doing. Without that, we will not be successful. The first place, and this is not a partisan issue, this is truly an American issue and a bipartisan issue. The first place where we should demonstrate resolve is through better support for Taiwan. Nothing is more urgent than in, uh, ensuring Taiwan has the capabilities and training to deter Chinese aggression. If we do not help them prepare now, we may all pay a much higher cost later. Another priority this year will be oversight of the implementation of the Taiwan Enhanced Resilience Act signed into law last December but it was not adequately funded in the appropriations process. I was very disappointed in this. The, the Biden administration said over and over again that it supports security assistance to Taiwan. However, it did nothing to advocate for Taiwan during the appropriations process. Similarly, this committee and Armed Services Committee has asked the administration uh, last summer for a prioritized list of Taiwan's military needs. Despite repeated requ requests, we still do not have that list. Beyond Taiwan, we must counter the CCP's malign influence both in the U.S. and abroad. I expect to hear about how the department addresses issues like influence in universities, Chinese uh, police stations here in the United States and in other countries, and corruption. I also hope to hear that the administration is going to counter the flow of Chinese fentanyl into the United States via third countries like Mexico. Steps we take domestically, of course, matter, but China actively avoids actions that could reduce the supply of chemicals that are illegally sent to the United States. Various parts of the U.S. government, including myself, have asked the Chinese government to take basic steps, like passing a know-your-customer type law. The CCP's response? That it won't cooperate until we remove a Chinese scientific institute from the entity list, and that we should just tell U.S. citizens not to do drugs. The Chinese government's tacit endorsement of this massive drug trade is just not right. Uh, also, uh, we need uh, the, to do the Chinese do more to alleviate human suffering uh, in the U.S. and abroad on this very important drug issue. 
Finally, I want to highlight uh, legislative priorities. As the uh, chairman has already stated, the chairman and I have met and discussed at length uh, our ideas on China. China is certainly our uh, uh, high priority in this legislative session as we go forward. And uh, we're, the, we're, we're going to have a joint bill, we hope, uh, to be introduced. And of course, that will uh, uh, include uh, parts of the Senate uh, bill in 2021 that we passed, the Strategic Competition Act. The chairman and I have already discussed collaborating on China legislation this year, and I look forward to working with him on that. Also, uh, we have the Econ Act that was previously uh, uh, introduced and probably will be part of uh, what we put in in our joint bill. Uh, with that, uh, we have a lot to cover, and I thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Senator Rich, and we do look forward uh, to working together on this. Our witnesses today are Deputy Secretary of State Wendy Sherman, Assistant Secretary of Defense for the Indo-Pacific Security Affairs, Dr. Eli Ratner. Uh, I understand that uh, Deputy Secretary Sherman provides some brief opening marks, as will, the, as will the Assistant Secretary. Both will be available to answer any questions we may have. I'll remind members again that there is an all-senators classified briefing on the PRC surveillance balloon scheduled at 1130 immediately following this hearing. That is a setting uh, which our witnesses may be better, better able to answer some of your questions on the balloon specifically, although this hearing is for, was called well before uh, the balloon incident and it is focused on broader China policy. With that, uh, Secretary Sherman, why don't you begin? Uh, Chairman Menendez, uh, Ranking Member Risch, distinguished members of this committee, thank you for the opportunity to testify today. Uh, please uh, let us uh, Add our welcome to the newest additions to the rostrum, uh, Senators Duckworth, Scott, and Ricketts. Uh, I and uh, this entire State Department looks forward to working with you. Uh, before we address our main topic, I just want to make one quick comment about the deadly earthquake in Turkey and Syria. The numbers of those lost keep rising. Our hearts ache for the families and communities devastated by this tragedy. I know that we all express our solidarity and are doing whatever we can for those who are suffering and we'll do whatever we can to support the recovery and the days and months ahead. It is truly uh, a tragic, tragic uh, situation uh, for all the people in the region. Uh, now to the subject at hand, the People's Republic of China. Uh, the geopolitical challenge, quite frankly, that will test American diplomacy like few issues in recent memory, and I associate myself with both uh, the comments of the chairman and the ranking member, about the challenges that we face. The PRC is the only competitor with the intent and means to reshape the international order, a fact borne out in the PRC's provocations in the South China Sea, its human rights abuses, its use of economic coercion, its threatening behavior against Taiwan, and of course, uh, what we have just uh, witnessed, and much more. Last week, the American people saw the latest example of that reality after the U.S. government detected, closely tracked, and shot down the PRC's high-altitude surveillance balloon that had entered our territorial airspace in clear violation of our sovereignty and international law. The Biden-Harris administration responded swiftly to protect Americans and safeguard against the balloon's collection of sensitive information <clears throat> we made clear to PRC officials that the presence of this surveillance balloon was unacceptable, and along the way we learned a thing or two which you'll hear in the classified briefing about the PRC's use of the balloon. Last Friday, Secretary Blinken called Director Wang Yi to say it would not be appropriate to visit Beijing at this time. On Saturday, as you all know, at the President's direction, the U.S. military successfully brought down the balloon off the East Coast. This lawful and deliberate action was achieved with no harm to civilians and with maximum ability to recover the payload. Again, more to say about this in the classified briefing. I look forward uh, to joining you in that briefing uh, to go through the full details with my interagency colleagues. Our response to this incident reaffirmed our core priorities, as the President said uh, Tuesday evening. We will always act decisively to protect the American people. We will never hesitate to defend U.S. interests and the rules-based international order. We will confront the dangers posed by the PRC with resolve and keep demonstrating that violations of any country's sovereignty are unacceptable. This irresponsible act put on full display 
what we've long recognized, that the PRC has become more repressive at home and more aggressive abroad. It reinforced the need for us to double down on our strategy, invest, align, compete. Simply put, with legislation like the Bipartisan Chips and Science Act and the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law, we are investing in the foundations of our strength on our shores. We are also modernizing our work at the State Department, as the Chairman has implored us and the Ranking Member to do, to mobilize our embassies and resources to take on this challenge, particularly through the China House, which we stood up with your support in December. We are aligning with like-minded allies and partners overseas, with the G7 and the EU, that tough work the Chairman talked about, with Japan, South Korea, Australia, Thailand, the Philippines, with India, and countries on every continent. We have made a concerted effort to share information that reinforces the scale of the threats posed by the PRC and the necessity of unity in confronting them. We don't seek another Cold War, but we do ask everyone to play by the same set of rules. Investing in ourselves and aligning with our partners strengthens our hands to compete with the PRC. With authorities provided with bipartisan congressional support, we will keep pushing back against the PRC's aggressive military, diplomatic, and economic practices. We will continue to oppose Beijing's unlawful acts in the South and East China Seas, hold accountable those involved in human rights violations in Tibet and Xinjiang, support the people of Hong Kong, and do everything possible to bring home unjustly detained Americans. If I may, Mr. Chairman, I'd ask for just a few more seconds uh, for my opening remarks. Uh, we will continue uh, to warn the PRC against providing military support to Russia, crack down on PRC entities engaged in harmful activities, and address the PRC's transnational repression, including, as the ranking member mentioned, the overseas police stations designed to restrict the rights of Chinese diaspora. Almost done. We will continue to prevent the PRC's exploitation of U.S. technology to enable its own military modernization. We will continue, and I'll be glad to answer questions about working for peace and stability across the Taiwan Strait. We may remain committed to our longstanding One China policy and oppose any unilateral changes to the cross-strait status quo. Our policy has not changed. What has changed is Beijing's growing coercion. So we will keep assisting Taiwan in maintaining a sufficient self-defense capability. Through it all, we have and will maintain open lines of communication so we can responsibly manage the competition between our countries. We do not seek conflict with the PRC. We believe in the power of diplomacy to prevent miscalculations that can lead to conflict. We are ready to work together where areas of cooperation are vital for our own interests from climate and public health to food security, narcotics, and more. Anywhere it can enhance U.S. interests and global peace and security. As President Biden said in his State of the Union, quote, today we're in the strongest position in decades to compete with China or anyone else, adding that, quote, winning the competition with China should, as the chairman and the ranking member has said, unite all of us. With your bipartisan support, with the resources approved by this committee, as the chairman has challenged us on, we will stand unified in the face of this challenge. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Secretary Ratner. Chairman Menendez, Ranking Member Risch, distinguished members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to testify on U.S. policy toward the PRC. The National Defense Strategy rightly identifies the PRC as the Defense Department's pacing challenge. This is because, as articulated in the administration's Indo-Pacific strategy, the PRC is, quote, combining its economic, diplomatic, military, and technological might as it pursues a sphere of influence in the Indo-Pacific and seeks to become the world's most influential power, end quote. China's military is central to these aims. In fact, in recent years, the PRC has increasingly turned to the PLA as an instrument of coercive statecraft in support of its global ambitions, including by conducting more dangerous, coercive, and aggressive actions in the Indo-Pacific region. In contrast to these revisionist goals, Today I would like to provide an update on the steps we are taking with our allies and partners to an advance an alternative vision of a free and open Indo-Pacific, a vision that is widely shared throughout the region and the world. In particular, I would like to highlight the steps we are taking 
First, to strengthen our alliance capabilities. Second, to develop a more distributed and resilient force posture. And third, to build stronger networks of like-minded allies and partners. Let me underscore the department's view that today our deterrent is strong and that these efforts will play an essential role in sustaining and further strengthening deterrence in the years and decades ahead. I'll say at the outset that 2023 has already been a groundbreaking year for US, al US alliances and partnerships in the Indo-Pacific. First, as it relates to alliance capabilities, with Japan, we have expressed our support for Tokyo's decision to acquire new capabilities that will strengthen regional deterrence, especially counter-strike capabilities. Under AUKUS, we remain encouraged by the significant progress we've made on developing the optimal pathway for Australia to acquire a conventionally armed, nuclear-powered submarine capability. Additionally, we are making significant investments in our defense ties with India to uphold a favorable balance of power in the Indo-Pacific and we will continue to fulfill our commitments under the Taiwan Relations Act and its principles, which include providing Taiwan with self-defense capabilities and maintaining our own capacity to resist any use of force that jeopardizes the security of the people of Taiwan. Second, on force posture, DOD has recently announced major upgrades throughout the region that will make our force posture more mobile, more distributed, more resilient, and lethal. In December, with Australia, we announced several new force posture initiatives that increase our capabilities across a range of domains in Australia, including US bomber task force rotations, fighter rotations, and future rotations of Navy and Army capabilities. Weeks later, the United States and Japan announced the first US forward deployment of a Marine littoral regiment to Japan. And just days ago, Secretary Austin was in Manila, where the United States and the Philippines announced four new EDCA sites at strategic locations across the country. Third, on networking. Despite PRC efforts to divide the United States from our allies and partners, DOD is focused on developing a constellation of coalitions to address emerging threats. That includes enhanced trilateral cooperation with Japan and Australia and with Japan and the Republic of Korea. It also includes our work in the Indo-Pacific with ASEAN, AUKUS, the Quad, and European allies. In closing, as I have done before, I'll conclude today by noting, as you did, Mr. Chairman, the powerful bipartisan consensus that has emerged around the China challenge and the commensurate need for the US government to focus its time, energy, and resources on the Indo-Pacific region. It is my enduring belief that we should be vigilant in preserving and advancing a bipartisan approach, which will remain fundamental to our ability to compete effectively against the PRC. Thank you for your time and attention today, and I look forward to your questions. Well, thank you both. We'll start a series of five-minute rounds. We'll go as long as we can. Uh, let me uh, start off, uh, Madam Secretary. Uh, you know, I view the China challenge as a multidimensional issue. It's not simply a simple economic competition, security, cultural. It goes across so many different dimensions and in so many different parts of the world. So, uh, and I look at that multidimensional challenge, and in my view, it's no secret that I believe that our diplomacy and resourcing lags uh, when it comes to meeting China's investments in diplomacy. So, uh, I'll be asking um, uh, OMB to, and the administration to significantly staff up if we want to meet the challenge. This is a huge dimension of what we need to meet. But how is the department looking at making sure that its operations and resourcing, particularly through staffing and personnel expertise, are sufficient to meet the diplomatic challenges we face with an increasing influential China around the world? Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Could not agree with you more that the scale and scope of the challenge is enormous. Uh, and as a result, uh, the Secretary of State asked me to take special responsibility, as you pointed out, for the organization, and I want to thank this committee and the Congress for supporting us in launching uh, what is the China Office of Coordination, better known as China House in the department. Uh, this is really a new matrix organization that is not just a rearrangement of uh, the chairs at the State Department, but rather a way to make sure that we have a multi-dimensional, multi-domain awareness, integration of everything we're doing around the world. 
that we not only have an integrated strategy towards China, working with the interagency as well, but every single mission around the world has a bespoke China strategy. Because as you pointed out, China is everywhere in the world. I run a, uh, a China uh, strategy group on a regular basis, bringing together all of those dimensions. Um, I uh, can't give you specifics because we're still working on the FY24 budget to be released uh, next month, but you will see in the budget uh, a deep and broad commitment and a significant increase in our resources for the Indo-Pacific as you have long uh, advocated for. In the FY23 budget, our foreign assistance reached 1.8 billion, a 50% increase from just seven years ago. So yes, I would agree with you, we are not where we need to be yet, but I believe we are changing our approach. To give you one specific example, in the Indo-Pacific, in the Pacific Islands, uh, where quite rightly uh, China has positioned itself, uh, we have taken a very uh, new and bold approach, again, with bipartisan support. We just opened an embassy in the Solomon Islands. Uh, we are working on posts, and we'll be announcing them soon, in Tonga and Kiribati. Uh, we are returning the Peace Corps uh, to that part of the world. So every single place uh, we have a bespoke approach, uh, we are following through on those strategies, and we are working right. on the resources to match that ambition. I look forward to seeing the, the budget proposal uh, as a pursuit of that. Here's another dimension uh, when we talk about multidimensional. The PRC is pursuing new and alarming ways to influence and control the United Nations, including attempts to curtail or defund UN efforts to improve its human rights system. Recently, in the UN Budget Committee, the PRC led efforts with Russia to slash budgets for several key human rights investigative mechanisms. How is the department pushing back uh, against their systematic effort to subvert the ability of the United Nations human rights systems to confront abuses in China and beyond? Uh, I think it's a very important point. Uh, it's why it was important for the United States to be able to rejoin the Human Rights uh, Council and to engage in a much more effective way at the UN. Um, you're quite right. The Chinese operate in the UN system very effectively for years. Um, they have put people in junior positions, which you simply can uh, sign up for financially and put people into slots, and then those people move up the chain in the UN system. Uh, our UN ambassador, Linda Thomas-Greenfield, is very engaged in looking at all the ways that the Chinese have penetrated the UN system and figuring out with our International Organization Bureau ways uh, to challenge all of that. No. Uh, but I quite, well, I quite agree with you. We have we, a lot of work to do. We could take, we, you know, not to want to copy too many things for the Chinese, sure. but we could definitely take a lesson from their page book. They have systematically, methodically, implemented their people in a way that ultimately leads them to have influence and a wide variety of cross-section of the UN. And that's not the only place, World Health Organization, I could go yes. on. Finally, what is the administration doing? Chinese imports of Iranian oil have exceeded one million barrels per day over the past three months. That relationship is mutually beneficial. Tehran gets to export its oil despite US sanctions, and Beijing receives a steep discount. Uh, so uh, what is the administration doing to increase the cost on China for helping Iran evade U.S. sanctions? How does it plan to make a measurable dent in Iran's oil exports to China and others such that Iran is not reaping the benefits of steady oil prices? Uh, excellent question. Uh, I don't have a full answer for you today, Mr. Chairman, but I will get back to you on that. What I will say is that we are working on sanctions evasion, uh, including uh, by uh, seeing uh, what's happening to tankers around the world and taking actions that we can uh, to interdict and stop those oil uh, shipments uh, and to sanction those companies that are undermining our sanctions regime around Iranian oil. But I agree with you, this is a problem. Well, and I it look is forward to hearing back from you and the, and the administration. Listen, you don't hide a million barrels a day uh, for the last three months and not know it's out there and it's happening and it's happening largely with impunity. So multidimensional China challenge is another one, but it also involves Iran, which is also part of our target. We, we should be doing much better. Senator Rush. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, 
I want to pick up on the point that the, the, the chairman raised, and that is uh, we're all aware, you two and the department is, of, of the uh, intrusion of China all over the globe, uh, different countries, different entities. Uh, the, the chairman mentioned the, the UN. They've got a, a particular uh, uh, target for the UN to, uh, to get uh, involved there in, in every nook and cranny that they can. One that concerns me um, is uh, they're doing a similar thing here in the United States at the colleges and universities, and that went on for years, pretty much under the radar with most people not knowing what was going on in the form of what they called the Confucius Institutes on these campuses. And uh, now, uh, first thing that happened is it, it stopped. Uh, universities quit adding them, and now they're actually dismantling them, and there's getting to be less and less. Having said that, the Chinese now, instead of going through the Confucius Institute, are buying chairs in the various departments, or they're, they're funding research in, in places like that. And, and again, this goes uh, widely unreported, and uh, occasionally it rears its head, uh, as we ha saw when we had a confirmation uh, from a uh, person from the University of Pennsylvania, and I, and I was staggered by the amount of money that China is putting into these universities. They're not doing it out of the goodness of their heart or to see that our universities are doing a good job. Um, what, what kind of program, what kind of effort do you have in that regard to monitor that and... Uh, do what's necessary to to unwind that because it's that when when this happens, there is no doubt that those colleges and universities are going to get soft on China. They just are. Money money has a way of doing that. So your thoughts on that, please, Wayne. Uh, so thank you, uh, Senator. Uh, as you point out, after peaking at a hundred Confucius centers in 2018, there are now only about 15. And so putting a spotlight on these issues is very critical to putting pressure on universities to understand what's happening and what they're doing. So uh, I greatly appreciate uh, the work that was done by this Congress and by the State Department to put a spotlight on the Confucius Centers. Uh, in addition, um, we are, in fact, doing the same thing, putting a spotlight where, in fact, there are other things you mentioned in your opening statement, police stations that are being created. One was closed down in New York when I was in Europe recently. In every capital where I know there are police stations, I've raised this issue. And putting a spotlight on this, asking governments, asking universities to take a look at what they're doing is critical. I do want to make one point, though, which I think we all have to be very careful of. We think that people-to-people -people exchanges are important. This Congress on a bipartisan basis has supported over the years people-to-people -people exchanges. Uh, we have, I think, over 290,000 Chinese students who come to American universities. We are very careful about looking at visas and making sure that in strategic departments uh, where it might influence or create a problem for our national security, we do not have those students come. But it is very important that we not close down these people-to-people -people exchanges. On the other hand, we only have about, I think, 385 Americans who are studying in China, and we probably need to do something to increase the number of Americans who are willing to study in China. And the final thing I would say is we all know that anti-Asian -Ameri anti -Anti American hate has increased. And we have to be very careful as we put a spotlight on China that we not increase hate against Asian Americans. It has led, as we have all seen, to horrifying circumstances uh, in our country, and we need to make sure that doesn't happen as we, in fact, crack down on exactly the kind of things that you've outlined, Senator. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I appreciate uh, those thoughts. Um, we've asked for that list about what the uh, Taiwanese are asking for. Do you know anything about that? Is, is that in your wheelhouse or not? Uh, what the Ty Taiwanese are asking for in what sense? In, uh, in uh, materials, military materials. Oh, uh, sure. Uh, so Jessica Lewis, uh, who... Uh, I know you, Jessica. I know you know Jessica well, is the Assistant Secretary for Mil Political Mil Military Affairs. And last year we notified 13 different sales to Taiwan including 10 new sales, uh, three amendments to previously notified sales. It represents the largest single number of notifications for Taiwan in the last uh, 20 years. Um, these included F-16 munitions, spare parts for the Taiwan Air Force, Army and Navy's existing capabilities and continued support for Taiwan's radar program. 
Since 2010, we have notified Congress of over $37 billion in arms sales to Taiwan, uh, including more than $21 billion since 2019. Um, we think this is quite critical. Uh, we believe uh, we need to help them in asymmetric uh, weapons uh, capabilities, help them train uh, and integrate their reserves, uh, make sure that they have mobile and agile systems. Uh, and uh, this is what uh, Jessica is very focused on, uh, to make sure that Taiwan has what it needs. I don't know whether Dr. Ratner uh, would like to add something from uh, the defense point of view on this. Briefly, because my time's up. Uh, Senator, I'll, I'll just echo what uh, Secretary Sherman said. We are extremely focused on understanding and communicating uh, with the Taiwans about what specific uh, def uh, articles, defensive articles, they need for their defense and for deterrence, uh, and we're laser focused on that uh, with all of the attentions and urgency it deserves. Yep. Thanks to both of you. I, I, did, I do want to underline that uh, in September of uh, last year, we wrote a letter asking some specific questions about what the tai, uh, Taiwanese were asking for and what it given. If you'd dig that out and see if we could get an answer to that, it would be very helpful. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Senator Murphy. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And I appreciate you raising the challenge of resources at the State Department right now. Um, a quick example of how this plays out in reality. Prior to the pandemic, I was in Dublin, and our embassy there told me that in the lead up to my visit, there had been a, a dramatic infusion of Chinese diplomatic personnel to their embassy there. The reason was there was a pending telecommunications tender in Ireland at the time, and the Chinese were able to send in literally dozens of individuals to help Huawei compete. Now, we were uh, represented in our embassy by a very capable defense attache, um, but we didn't have the ability, as the Chinese did, to be as nimble in making sure that we are supporting our efforts to make sure that it is Western companies and Western technology that is ultimately being able to keep pace with Chinese technologies. Just yet another example about how our resources just don't match Chinese resources now, and I appreciate the chairman for making that a priority. I'm trying to sneak in one question for each of you. I um, wanted to talk to you, uh, Secretary Sherman, about uh, the uh, challenge of fentanyl. Um, we saw in 2019 that things changed. China had been the sort of primary driver of illicit fentanyl and related equipment into the United States. China made some decisions internally, um, and the pace of that trade changed, but it just moved. Um, all of a sudden, the precursor and the equipment was moving to Mexico. Um, we had had a collaboration with China that we don't have today, and it hasn't resumed since the president's meeting with Xi. Um, can you talk about how we can um, rebuild this cooperation, if cooperation is indeed the way to go? And um, what practical effect did the 2020 designations of uh, a few forensic institutes and laboratories in China have on our ability to work together on this challenge? Uh, Senator, I suspect that every single one of us knows a parent who has lost a child to an overdose. I certainly do. Um, this is an incredibly high priority for the president, as you heard in the State of the Union, and an incredibly high um, priority for Secretary Blinken, and certainly will be when he does get back to meeting in Beijing, uh, which we will do when we think conditions are right, uh, this will be a topic of conversation. Uh, previously, as you noted, uh, the PRC agreed to impose class-wide controls on fentanyl in 2019, which brought direct shipments to the United States to almost zero. Um, but we still continue to see PRC precursor chemicals, uh, which are quite concerning, being used in illicit fentanyl production. And as you noted, uh, we are now seeing fentanyl come in uh, through Mexico. Uh, we have engaged not only Mexico, but other countries to put pressure on uh, China and other countries where there are precursor chemicals, not only fentanyl, but methamphetamine and other illicit synthetic drugs. Um, this is a really terrible problem. Uh, we are taking a, a laser focus on organizing an international effort uh, to stop this. Uh, thank you, Madam Secretary. Um, 
Secretary Ratner, a short question for you. Um, recently, uh, U.S. Air Force General Mike Minahan suggested in a memo to his troops um, that uh, my gut tells me we will fight China in 2025. I hope I am wrong. Um, this kind of rhetoric around the U.S.-China relationship, it undermines rather than furthers our goal of avoiding war. We want to be ready for conflict, but our goal is to avoid war. Um, so uh, uh, simp two questions. Um, one, do you believe that China has made the decision to pursue reunification with Taiwan through force? And two, do you believe that armed conflict between the United States and China is, as this general suggested, inevitable? Uh, Senator, as uh, Secretary Austin has now said repeatedly, uh, he and the department do not believe that an, an invasion of Taiwan is imminent or inevitable. Uh, that continues to be our assessment. Uh, the department is laser focused on maintaining deterrence today, tomorrow, uh, and into the future. Uh, and we're going to continue working with our allies and partners to do what's necessary to ensure a free and open Indo-Pacific. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Senator Rubio. Thank you both for being here. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I want to get a little broader because I think it's important to understand sort of the strategic vision behind our tactics on everything that we do. So if we go back to the late 80s, early 90s, end of the Cold War, and the gamble at the time was um, if we created this international economic order led by the U.S. and the West, uh, built on this global commitment to free trade, that uh, this you know, notion of uh, that this trade and commerce would bind nations together, via trade, via commerce and, and international interest and, and, and economic interest, that it would lead to more wealth and prosperity, that it would lead to democracy and freedom, basically domestic changes in many countries, and that it would ultimately ensure peace. The famous saying now seems silly that no two countries with McDonald's in them have ever gone to war. Um, that's obviously no longer the case. But the point being is that that was the notion behind it. It was what the then Secretary uh, General or Director General of the WTO called that world without walls, rules-based international order, others call it globalization. And, and basically our foreign policy has been built around that. Even though it's an economic theory, it basically is what we have built our foreign policy on. I think it's now fair to say that um, we admitted China to the World Trade Organization, Russia as well. I think it's now fair to say that while wealth certainly increased, particularly in China through its export-driven economy, uh, massive, uh, historic, unprecedented amount of economic growth in that regard, I don't think we can say either China or Russia are more democratic. In fact, they're more autocratic. I don't think we can say that they're more peaceful. Uh, Russia has invaded Ukraine now twice, and the Chinese are conducting live fire drills off the coast of Taiwan. So I think it's fair to say that gamble failed, and we have now to enter. And I think the president actually hinted at some of that in his speech the other night, and we're now entering a new era. What is that new era? What is our vision now for that world in which not just the global international order and world without walls did not pacify or bind nations, but in fact have now placed us in a situation where autocracies through a joint communique are openly signaling that we need to reject Western visions of democracy and the like. So before we can talk about what we're going to do, we have to understand what our strategic vision is. What is the strategic vision of this administration on what the new order of the world is? I guess Secretary Sherman. <laughs> Senator Rubio, that is... Uh, Can you answer that in two minutes and 30 yeah, seconds? Yeah, I was going to yeah. say, that's a really profound question that I probably can't fully answer in two minutes and 30 seconds. Uh, but let me say this. I think um, we all hoped for that vision. But what changed is that Xi Jinping is not the Xi Jinping of the 1990s that we all thought we knew. He is a man, as the president, as the secretary, as the secretary of defense has said, is the pacing challenge. The only country that wants to change that rules-based order that can successfully do so and are trying to make that happen. It is true that our way of life, our democracy, our belief in our values in the rules-based international order is being challenged and we have to meet that challenge. And I believe we can meet that challenge uh, by, as the President discussed in the State of the Union, making sure we invest in our own country, which is why the bipartisan support for the CHIPS Act, for the infrastructure bill, what we're doing in the Inflation Reduction Act, all of the bipartisan efforts that have taken place 
uh, here in Congress are essential to making sure we can invest in our own country to be able to meet that competitive need. Uh, second, that we align with our partners and allies. When President Biden began his presidency, he said that it was critical to reinvest in those partnerships and alliance, and it is paying off because we are putting forward those values. Look at what's happening in our pushing back against Russia in Ukraine. Um, and finally, uh, we have to be ready to compete, which is why we have to look at supply chains and make sure we either can produce things here in our own country or we can do it with partners or allies that ensure we have the resilience and the redundancy we need to meet this challenge. But it is, above all else, a challenge about our values, and it is why the President really ended his State of the Union speaking about democracy, what it means how we have to show what that means here at home and what it means around the world. All right, I only have 10 seconds left. So, uh, Secretary Ratner, a real quick question. I'm not going to ask you about invasion of Taiwan. Very simple. Is there any way that we end this decade without China doing something about Taiwan one way or the other? Is there any way you can envision getting to the end of this decade without China wanting to do something about Taiwan? Senator, wanting to is quite different than doing it. So, which uh, I, think they, I, I think they have intention. Uh, but I, absolutely, I think we can get to the end of this decade without them committing major aggression against Taiwan. Thank you. Senator Van Hollen. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank both of you uh, for your testimony uh, today. Um, Madam Secretary, great to see you. Uh, I want to follow up on some of the things you just spoke about as well as in your testimony, which is that we know uh, China has the ambition of becoming the dominant country and self-sufficient in key leading end te and edge technologies, right? And they have a plan to do it. Uh, they have their 10-year plan and they try to follow those uh, plans. Uh, I agree with you and with the President that the number one thing we need to do is get our house in order here at home. The CHIPS and Science Act was a very important piece of legislation. Uh, the CHIPS piece, as you know, is funded. We need to fully fund uh, the science part of the CHIPS and Science Act uh, to maintain our competitive edge. At the same time, we need to do everything we can to prevent the most sensitive high-end technologies that, are, that originate in the United States or with our partners from falling into China's hands in a way that they can use them and incorporate them in their military. And I do want to um, uh, applaud the administration for its efforts uh, you mentioned in your testimony the October uh, 2022 uh, rules uh, prohibiting the export of U.S. origin technologies. That's an important step. I strongly supported the prior administration's efforts with regard to Huawei. What the Biden administration has done is really expand that, not just to, from one company, but across the board to very sensitive technologies. Um, also uh, want to applaud you for the agreement that is either finalized or in shape with respect to uh, preventing the export of high-end manufacturing equipment um, for semiconductors uh, that we are reaching with Japan and the Netherlands. That's an important part. But obviously the success of a strategy to prevent our most sensitive U.S. origin technologies from going to China relies on our partners. It also relies on our partners who have also developed technologies from agreeing not to export their most sensitive technologies. That one example we just, I just mentioned is a, is a good case, but obviously to be successful, we need to do this across the board, our EU partners, our other democratic partners in East Asia and elsewhere. Can you talk about the progress we're making in enlisting help uh, from those, uh, those countries? Uh, very critical subject. Um, thank all of you for your support when it comes to uh, what we've done uh, to make sure that sensitive uh, technologies uh, here uh, don't find their way to China. Um, I think uh, we are also looking at um, a pilot potentially on outbound investment as well of sensitive technologies, and that's something that we are continuing to discuss and we'll consult with all of you on Capitol Hill uh, before we go forward, uh, should we go forward, but I think it's important. Um, we, um, early on, my first trip as Deputy Secretary of State was to Brussels uh, to launch the U.S.-EU-China dialogue. Um, out of conversations, uh, we also began Indo-Pacific consultations with the EU. Uh, we've made a lot of progress in that regard. 
Um, I think we are really together uh, in a way we have not been before on China writ large and Taiwan specifically, which was a topic that uh, the EU didn't want to talk about at first, and now it's in every document, whether it's the G7 or the EU uh, or NATO. Uh, China is now a strategic component of every uh, discussion that we have. The TTC, the Trade and Technology Council, uh, that's led by the Secretary of State and the Secretary of Commerce, is laser focused on technology. Um, the Secretary and his modernization of the State Department, uh, with your support, bipartisan support, has stood up a um, uh, cyber and digital policy bureau and an emerging tech um, uh, envoy because we understand this arena is the future. So I think we're making good progress with allies and partners around the world, but it is very painstaking work. Yeah, uh, but, critical, could, um, but critical. Well, thank you. No, I appreciate uh, the recognition of the urgency of this matter, and I, I know you're working on it because um, getting this right is key to the success, right? If, you, if you're trying to prevent the export of key technologies, one hole in the boat <laughs> uh, can ruin the whole enterprise. I do want to uh, mention a bill that um, I authored with former Senator Ben Sass uh, called Protecting U.S. Intellectual Property that gives the executive branch many more tools to go after those who steal U.S. technologies. A report is due on that um, in 180 days, um, so look forward to receiving that uh, from you as another part of this strategy uh, going forward. And uh, look forward to another case. The critical minerals piece, obviously, is another big piece in supply chains, but uh, I am out of time. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> Senator Haggerty. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm going to move quickly. Um, we've got a lot to cover here. Um, Deputy Secretary Sherman, my first question is going to be directed to you, and welcome. Um, the seven-day Chinese spy balloon incident was one of the most visible, persistent, and egregious violations of U.S. sovereignty and airspace since the 9-11 terrorist attacks. It was shocking for me to see in real time the Chinese spy balloon fly with impunity over the states that are home to some of America's most sensitive military and nuclear weapon sites, including my home state of Tennessee. But the Chinese Communist Party is also responsible for less visible but nevertheless deadly violations of American sovereignty that are taking place every day. I'm talking about China's exportation of fentanyl chemical, fentanyl chemical precursors. The CDC found that over 100,000 Americans died of drug overdoses in 2021. The vast majority of those deaths, over 71,000, are deaths from fentanyl. The DEA has reported that China is a primary source of the fentanyl-related substances that are trafficked directly into the United States. So my first question, De Deputy Secretary Sherman, since taking office, how many sanctions designations has the Biden administration imposed on Chinese entities that are involved in the manufacture and exportation of fentanyl precursors that are annually killing over 71,000 Americans, including children? Uh, Senator, I'll have to get back to you on the specific number of sanctions and what those sanctions have been. But I'll, I I'll look forward to, to, to getting that number, Secretary Sherman. I'm sure. today interested in what the State Department is doing to hold China accountable. And I want to flag for you something that's quite disturbing. On January 30th of this year, when the United States imposed sanctions against Mexican drug lords, the Treasury Department's press release called out a major drug lord for impo importing, and I quote, precursor chemicals from China into Mexico, which are then used to manufacture synthetic drugs, including fentanyl, end quote. The Treasury Department's press release even named the Chinese entity that's involved in illicit fentanyl trade. I've got a copy of that press release right here that I would like to enter into the record, Mr. Chairman. Without objection. But in contrast, Secretary of State Blinken's press statement on these same sanctions completely omitted any mention of China or Chinese entities. This was a missed opportunity in my mind for the State Department to publicly hold China accountable for their fentanyl precursors. So Mr. Chairman, I'd like to enter the second statement as well from the Department of State that fails to mention China at all. So ordered. Deputy Secretary Sherman, why did the State Department admit any mention of China in the Secretary of State's press release statement on the fentanyl sanctions against Mexican drug lords? Senator, as I said earlier, Secretary Blinken makes the ending of this horrible, horrible ability to kill Americans over. Uh, he uh, certainly would have had this as a key topic uh, in his meetings in Beijing and at some point when we believe the conditions are right, uh, we will uh, be going to Beijing. Well, uh, I'll, I'll reclaim my cut time against Deputy it, Secretary Sherman. A lot to cover here. 
Communist China is a state sponsor of fentanyl. Yes. And I'm gravely concerned that the State Department omitted mentioning China and for, fentanyl, for these fentanyl sanctions because the Secretary of State wanted to have this trip in Beijing. They didn't want Absolutely to infuriate not the Xi case. Absolutely not the case, Senator. News, re news reports that you run the State Department's biweekly PRC strategy group that oversees the State Department's China policy decision. And I feel like you missed a great opportunity here by pulling back on a chance to mention the fentanyl sanctions, to publicly hold China accountable for its role in the fentanyl scourge that's killing children in America. And when you add the recent news reports that the Biden administration didn't cancel Secretary Blinken's trip to Beijing until five or six days after learning about the Chinese spy balloon's initial violation of our U.S. sovereignty, it's just not a good look, and it doesn't inspire confidence. I think the administration can and, and can do a better job of holding China accountable. I appreciate your expertise in, in moving that direction. I'd like to go to a different topic now, Taiwan. I was proud to contribute to support and vote for Chairman Menendez's law in the FY23 NDAA known as the Taiwan Enhanced Resilience Act. But time's not on our side. The United States has roughly 19 billion backlog in annual arms sales, in, in arms sales to Taiwan. And at a recent public event, CIA Director William Burns said that the United States knows, and I quote, as a matter of intelligence, that CCP General Secretary Xi Jinping has ordered China's military to be capable of conducting an invasion of Taiwan by 2027. Chairman Menendez's Taiwan law annually authorizes as much as $2 billion in grants of foreign military financing to Taiwan between now and 2027. So Deputy Secretary Sherman and Assistant Secretary Ratner, do you support the full implementation of Menendez's law, laws, the Menendez laws, $2 billion in annual grants of foreign military financing to, to Taiwan? I just appreciate a yes or no answer. I certainly think we have to look at every way possible uh, to make sure that we meet the needs of Taiwan. I think you all are aware that there are production and delivery delays worldwide, and reviewing those systems and talking to the private sector about those long lead production timelines and uh, delivery delays uh, because they are affecting all our FMS partners, not just Taiwan. I understand. Is, I just want to know if you support this move. Is that a yes? Uh, yeah, I believe we need to look at every single option okay. we have. Mr. Ratner, can you answer me yes or no on this? Uh, Senator, the department was clear that any uh, authorization in the National Defense Authorization Act should be met with an appropriation yep. as it relates to Taiwan security support. Chairman Mendez's Taiwan law also authorizes a billion dollars annually in presidential drawdown authority for Taiwan. So my next question to the two of you. And is Senator you Haggerty, you're about 50 seconds over your time. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'll come back to this, but I'd just like to say um, that China is a serious and comprehensive threat to Taiwan. I just want to see us do everything we can to avoid the lessons that we learned in Ukraine, to make them tough, to make this, to, to, to deter what might happen. Thank you, sir. We agree. Thank you to the witnesses. I want to ask a, a question that has sort of a Virginia tie to it. Um, China has one of the most uh, sophisticated uh, global campaigns of repression against dissidents around the world of any nation. And in particular, the FBI has warned that China is conducting a global campaign to target Uyghur human rights activists. Uh, the Uyghur community in Virginia is one of the largest in the United States, and we have a number of constituents who have been engaged in Uyghur human rights issues who have been targeted and harassed here, but also find their family members still living in the Xinjiang area uh, affected. What is the United States government, particularly the State Department, doing to make sure that the authoritarian reach of China against people living in the United States is limited? Uh, so, Senator, one of the things that we have immediately done uh, working with the FBI is to look at the police stations that uh, China is creating here and around the world. Uh, New York's uh, police station, so to speak, was closed down. These aren't police stations at all. Uh, what they are are policing uh, the diaspora, um, Uyghurs and others uh, in uh, the Chinese orbit, uh, harassing them, um, putting them at great risk. Uh, and so uh, we are working with law enforcement here very closely uh, to make sure that China cannot reach into the United States and harass and further undermine the human rights of Uyghurs, ethnic minorities, and Chinese and Chinese Americans. And the, the Chinese do actually have imprisoned a number of the family members of 
American residents who have advocated for Uyghur human rights, what is the U.S. government doing to try to intercede on behalf of those unjustly imprisoned in China? So in uh, the Secretary of State and I have met with all of the families or a group of the families that are quite concerned about this and concerned about their family members. And when we have met with the Chinese or communicated with the Chinese, we have raised these cases. In some instances, families don't want us to raise the cases because they're afraid it will target their family members. So we are uh, really guided by what the families want, uh, but we will try to do whatever we possibly can. Uh, and I have to tell you, meeting with those Uyghur families, just as when we meet with all of the families of those detained in China, or held in exit bans in China uh, are some of the hardest meetings uh, I have to do. Let me switch topics. The, uh, the title of today's hearing is Evaluating U.S.-China Policy in an Era of Strategic Competition. And I think we all know the competition is intense across multiple fronts, and in many areas it's more than competition. China is an adversary. And yet one of the things that we probably should do for our own good and for the good of the world is seek are there areas of cooperation because it would benefit the world greatly if they could see as, as tough as this competition and even adversarial relationship is, there is at least enough communication to recognize on some small set of issues the need to find common cause and work together. That would be good for the United States, good for China, but it would be good for the world to see that too in terms of sending a stability message. What are areas uh, as you, you know, stand up China House and, and run U.S.-China policy, what are areas that might be most likely to find some cooperation for the good of our countries and the good of the world? So the ones that we talk about the most, uh, starting with the one that uh, Senator Haggerty mentioned, which is counter-narcotics, uh, which is quite critical for all the reasons that he said that others uh, and that uh, Ranking Member uh, Rich raised as well, uh, working on climate, quite frankly, we cannot meet the challenge on climate unless China is working with the rest of the world. I'm glad that they have reopened communications between their envoy and special presidential envoy for climate, John Kerry. Uh, I hope that that conversation can continue even in this difficult time. Uh, we've talked about working together on global health, which may sound sort of strange given that the Chinese have been very protective of their data and genomic sequencing on COVID-19. Um, I know there's great concern up here about the origins of COVID-19, which uh, remains not resolved yet by the intelligence community. I'd urge any briefings you might want on that uh, to have with the intelligence community. But I do think we have to work together on global health uh, because we're going to see more pandemics uh, and uh, we need to be working together in this regard. So those are three, and of course, people-to-people -people exchanges, ways that we can have uh, our folks safely uh, know each other in a better way because we do not see conflict with the Chinese people. Um, we do many things um, uh, and have discovered things together in our scientific community where it's in our security interest to do so. Uh, we have to be careful, thoughtful, uh, but nonetheless, I hope that we can engage in people-to-people -people exchanges appropriately. Thank you. Senator Paul. Mr. Chairman, it's estimated that between uh, 5 and uh, 18 million people died from COVID-19 worldwide. To a significant number of scientists, the evidence suggests that this originated from a lab leak in Wuhan. Does the State Department fund coronavirus research in China? Do we fund coronavirus? I don't believe so, but I don't know. I'll double check and we'll get back to you on that, Senator. The answer is yes, you do. And it's been going on for more than a decade and it's done through a program called PREDICT and then the Global Virome. And why this is important is we had a million Americans die and we really haven't had any discussion of this. No hearings, nothing. People are unaware that they're even funding the research. We found out recently through the House unclassified report that money is going from the NIH to American universities, to the, um, uh, uh, the Academy of Military Medical Sciences Research in China. We are subcontracting money and sending it over, but millions is coming from the State Department. So the idea is this, we will identify all the viruses in the world, we'll be safer because we identified them. But here's the question, are we safer to have some guy or some woman crawling down a cave 
10 hours away from Wuhan, coming up with bat guano, coming up with viruses and bringing it to a city of 15 million like Wuhan. This is what's been going on for a decade. It's a setup for an accident. It's a setup for a mistake. And nobody's doing anything about it. We continue to fund it. The main group that's been getting this money is EcoHealth Alliance, over $100 million, a lot of it through the State Department. They continue to get money. They don't file the reports on time. They didn't stop their experiments. And yet we reward them with more money. 15 million people died, and we haven't done a thing about it. Nobody seems to care. We're not even sure we fund it. The State Department's a big funder of this project. It's a multi-decade-long project, but there are scientists, as we speak, from Stanford, from MIT, from prestigious universities around the country. These are not partisans. Most of them are not Republicans who stand up and say, oh, my God, what are we doing? Bringing these viruses from remote bat caves to major metropolitan areas and with no controls over this. So we've been asking for information from the State Department because we want to know more about this. U.S. Right to Know has been sending FOIA requests for two and a half years, and they don't get anything. So, Mr. Chairman, I've sent two letters. Some of them are six months old now, and we get a, you know, whatever. We're not going to give you any information. What I would hope for is that we could have – people always talk about bipartisanship. Could we not get bipartisan support for records? This is not partisan. We want to know what the U.S. State Department is funding. NIH resists our, our requests on their funds. The two things that we know for certain that have led us to believe this came from the lab that are big came because one was leaked, and this was a DARPA request. So the Chinese researchers in China wanted from DARPA money to create a virus that, guess what, looks exactly like COVID-19. They asked for it in 2018. We turned them down. Fortunately, we did the right thing for once. We turned them down. That doesn't mean they didn't do the research. And so many scientists at an aha moment, they saw this and they said, oh, my goodness, they asked for money to create something that looks almost exactly what we got. So in nature, you do not have coronaviruses that infect people that have what is called a furin cleavage site. Chinese said, give us money. We were going to stick a furin cleavage site to allow it to infect humans more. We found out that not because you let us know or not because the NIH let us know, they still resist. This is top secret. This is classified. This is a whole problem of classification, but it's also to cover up things. So we don't know anything about the 28 thing, but we had an illegal leak that went to somebody in the media that's now public that said the Chinese wanted to create a virus just like COVID-19 in 2018. The other thing we know is three researchers in the Wuhan lab and the Wuhan Institute of Virology got very sick with flu-like symptoms similar to COVID in November. We only know that, though, because the Trump administration on the way out declassified it. So we have to get over all the classification. We also have to be more forthcoming. And I'm hoping the chairman will consider looking at our requests. These are not partisan. We want to know all the information about funding of research in China. We want to know the interactions. There were cables going back and forth between the State Department saying, holy cow, they're not wearing gloves. They don't wear masks and doing this research. They're doing it in what's called a BSL-2 as opposed to a BSL-4. Most of the research that we think escaped was not done in the appropriate lab. And the State Department knew about it, but we've had no hearings about this. They refused to give us information. 15 million people died, a million Americans died, and you won't give us information. So what I would ask is look at our request. This isn't partisan. This should be about discovering the origins of this. The scientific community is about 50-50 now, and I would hope that we, we suspect the Chinese of not being honest and withholding information, but it's sad that the U.S. government is withholding information from its representatives. Uh, I'll take back your request again, Senator. I would urge uh, a briefing perhaps in a skiff with the intelligence community on this, um, because as you know, uh, there is not a single view uh, about this particular set of issues, uh, but I understand your desire to understand what occurred. We're asking you for unclassified information that you hold, not intel. I understand that. Senator Merkley. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman, and, and welcome to both of you, and thank you for the work that you're doing. I want to uh, echo uh, Tim Kaine's concern about transnational repression. Uh, the Congressional Executive Commission on China, uh, which I chaired the last two years, has done a lot of work on this, and it's just been such an expansion. I just want to mention people like uh, the American citizen, Rushan Abbas, whose sister, a Uyghur doctor, uh, continues to serve a 20-year sentence for the crime of participating in a terrorist organization, meaning 
that she's being retaliated against because her sister here in the United States is an advocate for human rights. And I do not see uh, how we can tolerate a relationship in which the Chinese are targeting American citizens. Now, they're the only ones, but they are the biggest perpetrator of this. And every other country is looking at this and going, can we adopt this model as well? And I know the State Department, Secretary Sherman, is taking this seriously. But I want to mention a couple things. One is that there has to be a sense that other diplomatic efforts with China all have to involve saying this transgression against people in the U.S. is a red line. And I just don't feel we've elevated it to, to, to that. Uh, second of all, uh, I spoke with the FBI about creating a particular tip line specifically for transnational repression or specifically from China because the FBI wants people to call their general tip line and then they've been referred to a most wanted tip line. And it's like, no, you've got to have people who speak Chinese, who understand the culture, who understand this history, who we can circulate that connection where they know that they're going to have an trouble, not in danger, if you will, their folks, their relatives back home more. But if we want to truly understand the scope of what China is doing, we have to have much better feedback from the Chinese community. And we're not going to get it through, through just a generalized FBI tip line. So I just wanted to mention that and say I think this is something that I'd like to persuade the department to, to pursue that I think would be helpful in understanding the scope and starting to address it in an effective manner. And I'll just pause and see if you'd like to share any comment on this. Uh, so thank you. Uh, we quite agree that transnational repression is a, a terrible, terrible situation for so many. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier, the Secretary of State and I met with uh, families here in America who are concerned about their Uyghur families abroad, as well as uh, the fact that families uh, are repressed in uh, Xinjiang because of advocacy by family members here in the United States. And we raise these issues uh, with uh, the Chinese in every uh, appropriate uh, meeting that we can. Um, we are working hard to shut down so-called police stations, uh, which really go after the diaspora here and uh, Chinese American citizens. Um, so I think uh, your suggestion about the tip line will certainly go back to law enforcement. We work very closely with the FBI, which shut down the police station in New York. Um, these are very tough issues, uh, but I understand your concern for them. It's quite horrible. We are absolutely not going to get uh, the, uh, a sense of the scope of the problem if, if people are directed to some generalized uh, criminal line. That, that does not work. You can't publicize that among the human rights community and have people uh, trusted or feel. Uh, Secretary Ratner, I want to turn to military deconfliction with China. Uh, and uh, deconfliction is extremely important when you have tensions with another country. We went all th through this uh, for many years with the Soviet Union over uh, concerns, especially the risks of nuclear war. But we can't have deconfliction if the other side won't pick up the phone. How are we doing in deconfliction? And I assume we, you know, we have some recent evidence from uh, having responded to the balloon over, over the United States. Uh, Senator Merkley, thank you uh, for your question. It's a really important one. And Secretary Austin, has said repeatedly how important it is that we have open lines of communication between the United States military and uh, our counterparts uh, in China. Um, that is because we need to communicate our priorities. Uh, it's because our militaries need to be having serious conversations about strategic issues like space and cyber and nuclear All weapons. All very important, but my question is, how are we doing on that? How are the Chinese responding? Are they open to it? Have we built better lines, or is it really still a big problem? It remains a problem, Senator. We have, uh, Secretary Austin has met with his counterpart face-to-face, uh, -face, both at the Shangri-La Dialogue last year in Singapore and again in Cambodia uh, in November. Uh, however, over the last several months, uh, the PLA has continued to view the mill-mill relationship as something that they turn on and off uh, to express displeasure with other things that are happening in the relationship. We think that's really dangerous. We continue to have an outstretched hand, including uh, immediately following uh, the downing of the balloon, and unfortunately, uh, to date, the PLA is not answering that call. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, as I had announced earlier, we're going to, at some point, have to uh, close the hearing a little early because of the uh, joint briefing that will take place, at which the Secretary has to be at. So right now, I have Senator Young uh, next, and then uh, 
Senator Cardin, assuming no one re comes next, and maybe we'll get, try to get to uh, uh, Senator Romney, and that probably will be it. And we welcome, as I did earlier, Senator Scott to the committee, uh, who was playing his role as ranking member on the budget, I mean, on the banking committee, and that's why he wasn't here earlier, but welcome again. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, yeah, thank you, Chairman. Uh, thank you to our panelists for being here today. I'd, I'd like to change gears a bit, uh, discuss economic coercion. Uh, as, as I know our panelists understand, China has uh, effectively weaponized its, uh, the economic interdependence that the world economy has on, on uh, their workshop of the world, as, as we colloquially have been calling it. Uh, they've been intimidating multinational firms, denying market access and retaliation for even mere utterances uh, from world leaders, and engaging in all manner of, of other activities uh, to apply pressure, especially to smaller island nations throughout the Asia-Pacific. The obvious goal here is uh, to intimidate uh, these, these various countries and to give them a choice. Either uh, they can accommodate... Uh, the desires of the Chinese Communist Party. They can facilitate uh, their ability to realize geopolitical ends through this economic interdependence, or these nations can take a chance on a free and open order, on democracy, on the United States and uh, our partners and allies. Uh, China's not the only offender not the only country to try and weaponize economic interdependence. We saw Russia do this in the lead-up to uh, the invasion of Ukraine last year with uh, weaponization of uh, the uh, uh, oil and, and, and gas dependency of, of Europe. And so what is the United States doing? I know we're uh, attempting diplomatically to deal with this. Uh, there have been some other uh, activities that perhaps you can touch on when I turn it over to you. But... Uh, <clears throat> I just came back from uh, the Asia Pacific. I visited with President Tsai in, in Taiwan and uh, Japanese leaders, and I heard a lot about e economic coercion, more than any other topic. Taiwan's been on the receiving end of this, as has Japan, but Japan is, has uh, been formalizing a policy to counter uh, economic coercion, and they want the United States to act. And uh, to that end, I've, I've introduced bipartisan legislation with Senator Coons, and uh, the aim is to allow the United States to quickly appropriate uh, uh, tangible uh, assistance, give it to uh, those who are on the receiving end of, of this coercion, provide other tangible benefits to partners and allies who've been victimized by malign behavior. Specifically, we propose... Uh, providing the President of the United States, this one and future presidents, with a range of tools and authorities that include boosting trade with an affected ally or partner, requesting Congress provide aid, loan guarantees, or export financing, and temporarily adjusting duties on select U.S. imports to make up for an affected country's lost exports or to disadvantage an adversary's imports in our market. Now, crucially, we also call for coordination of all these activities with our economic partners and allies. The G7 meeting will be held in Japan in Hiroshima in May. This will be item number one on the agenda, and I commend uh, Prime Minister Kishida for making this a priority. Um, my sense is the administration is, is on board with this approach, and um, I'm, I'm complimented by that, and, and we're going to have more of my colleagues joining this effort as well. Deputy Secretary Sherman... Um, it seems to me, based on everything I just said, that the tool, we don't have sufficient tools to properly deal with these coercive activities. Do you agree with this assessment? And uh, very briefly, why? Uh, so thank you very much, Senator. Our teams, I think, are in very close touch with yours and Senator Coons to work on this legislation. We are trying to expand our economic coercion toolbox. Uh, we've learned a lot because of Lithuania, Australia, and others. Yes. And as you point out in the Russia-Ukraine situation as well, we agree with you that uh, Prime Minister Kishida making this a top priority for his G7 presidency is critical. Uh, we've done uh, tabletop exercises on this. We think this is a critical area. We've managed to support Lithuania and other countries that have faced this and learned a lot in the process. So thank you. 
for your efforts, and we look forward to continuing to work closely with you on this. Great. I heard everything I needed, sufficient for this uh, uh, briefing, but I, so I'm going to move on very briefly to a chips and science implementation question. Um, <clears throat> Beijing's been stealing our stuff, our intellectual property, for a lot of years now. We don't want them to steal this stuff, this cutting-edge, national security-oriented research funded through chips and science. Um, and uh, Chips and Science Act appropriates $500 million to the Department of State in part to support international IT security to protect this intellectual property. Could you very briefly indicate what the consequences are of the lack of IT security and how the PRC is exploiting our current system? And then uh, to the extent you've, you've already implemented some of the Chips and Science provisions, uh, give us a, a summary, please. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for the ITSE fund, which is Promote, Protect, and ICT provision at the State Department in support of the foreign diplomacy uh, in concert with the Commerce Department, which has the enormous lion's share of this funds. Uh, we have notified up to the Hill uh, some of the projects and lines of effort. Uh, we're creating baselines this year leading up to uh, making significant process, uh, progress in the five-year horizon that you all laid out uh, in the provision of this fund. Look forward to discussing details with you in a private setting. My office will follow up. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you. Senator Cardin, then uh, Senator uh, Romney, and then that will be the end of the hearing. Well, let me thank both of you for being here. Uh, I'm going to follow up on Senator Young's point. I was with our Chairman, Senator Menendez, in our hemisphere and saw the challenges of China uh, penetration on the debt diplomacy issue. So let me mention a country like Argentina. Argentina has a debt problem. It's not terribly attractive for private investment because of its debt policies. And yet, when they need to borrow money, China is willing to be there. And we know China does it on the cheap. They don't get their value. But they get hooked by this debt diplomacy, which can be against our national security interests. So I just really want to underscore it's more than East Asia and Pacific. It's our own hemisphere where we see China very much uh, penetrating and using this as leverage for their geopolitical ag agenda. I, I know that you set up the China House. I believe it's in the East Asia and Pacific um, uh, Bureau. But can you just assure us that there is a coordinated strategy beyond East Asia and Pacific, which is critically important, but also in our own hemisphere? Very quickly on both. On debt, um, as I think you all are probably aware, when Secretary Yellen uh, went to Africa, uh, debt was front and center uh, an issue for her. In Zambia, she underscored that all creditors, including Beijing, must meaningly participate in debt relief efforts for Zambia. In Sri Lanka, uh, indeed, debt is a huge problem. The Paris Club has now taken some action, and pressure is, and India has stepped forward, but we're putting pressure on China to, in fact, also come to the table since most of the debt is with the Chinese. Agree with you in Latin America, they can use their SOE capability to just put money on the table, but ultimately it often ends up in debt for countries, Argentina being a good example. So agree with you, and we're working on all of that. In terms of the China House, I want to commit uh, several things to you. As Senator Rich knows uh, well, because he really focused us on this, um, China House uh, has liaisons coming from every part of the department who spend some time in China House, go back to their home bureaus, so there is truly an integrated beyond EAP strategy. It all comes up through EAP, but to me, uh, who has responsibility for everything all over the world. And so, quite frankly, um, yes, it may be housed in EAP, but that's just the anchor. It goes out throughout the world. Look forward to working with you with that. In order to get a little bit of credit on this committee, can I yield my two minutes to Senator Booker so that my remaining two minutes? Uh, you may. I'd like, I'd like to get on a good side of New Jersey. That is an extraordinary act of grace <laughs> and generosity. It's only uh, topped by your wisdom and sagacity, yeah, my friend. And, and don't use your whole two minutes uh, <laughs> complimenting him. <laughs> <laughs> um, I really appreciate that. Uh, uh, I really want to get into the... Um, the Development Finance Corporation and the um, real uh, 
uh, power, I think, of that. You know, Congress created in part as a response to the Rust Belt, uh, Rust and Boat and Road, uh, Belt and Road initiatives. Um, and you know uh, its importance of providing loans, equity investments, and more. Uh, the uh, DFC has limits, but I really think it could be something that could be used in a stronger way. Uh, the agency, I think, has a potential to boost international development opportunities and really help to level the playing field and expand opportunities for us, uh, not just economically, but also in terms of national security. Uh, there's a famous saying that, you know, if you're not at the table, if, you, if, if you're not at the table, you're in the menu. Um, and I, I want to see if there's ways that we can be more at the table using um, uh, the DFC. And so I'm wondering, uh, things like the DFC, the uh, Millennium Challenge Corporation, uh, can we use this to really expand our toolbox, uh, not just for, uh, for economic opportunity, but economic diplomacy? Oh, Senator, this is so important. And in fact, um, thank you all for looking at what the DFC can do and whether its uh, opportunities can be expanded in ways that are helpful, particularly to countries that maybe not are at the bottom of the uh, uh, development ladder, but sort of in between trying to raise up. Um, the Development Finance Corporation is also working very closely with our PGII initiative, the Partnership for Global Infrastructure Investment, uh, with the private sector as well, with MCC. We have to use every single tool we have because our greatest strength is bringing the private sector together with what we're doing in the public arena. Uh, China can't do that. Yes, it can put money on the table without strings attached, but the strings come later. Uh, countries go into debt. Chinese take their assets. They don't transfer capabilities to countries to do their own development. So couldn't agree with you more. Love to work with you in deepening this ability. Thank you. Please. Okay. Senator Romney will close us out. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for keeping us all here so I get my few moments. But uh, there are just a few things I want to mention, which is Chairman Menendez and I uh, last year authored an amendment which was passed in the NDAA that requires the United States State Department to develop a comprehensive strategy to address the, uh, the threat of an emerging China. Uh, Ranking Member Risch and I sent a letter to President Biden urging, urging the administration to start implementing our legislation. In our letter, we requested an update on the progress after 60 days. The 60 days mark has passed. Now, Secretary Blinken has laid out three principles that the administration is pursuing in dealing with China, invest, align, and compete. But I would note that we need to go from principles to a comprehensive strategy and include tactics. And that includes our approach to developing countries, uh, to uh, our global trade arrangements, to economic measures we might want to put in place, to our research and development investments here, to our military procurement, to global communication strategies, to access to our universities, uh, access to our laboratories, to visas we provide to ch the Chinese, to international institutions that we're going to be involved with, uh, to our social media strategies, to raw material strategies and our processing here of those raw materials, to the role of USAID, to defending the tactics the Chinese are using, you get where I'm going, which is a comprehensive strategy includes dozens upon dozens of strategic and tactical decisions that are combined, changed over the years. But it is essential, in my view, that we develop that kind of strategy and that it's kept in a classified setting, doesn't have to go out publicly, but we really need that. We also, in this legislation, looked at the uh, strategies of that nature that were developed by uh, Presidents Truman and Reagan and others, uh, the work of George Kennan and Dean Acheson, and said, okay, how were these strategies developed back then? How did they put them together as they were dealing with strategies to deal with the Soviet Union? And they involved outside individuals, not just internal, because they knew internal people would be captured by groupthink. They wanted people from the outside, some who were had experience in developing these kinds of strategies. I, I spent my private sector career, uh, doing something called strategy consulting. That's what we, we help companies develop strategies. I have to tell you, it drives me nuts to watch us deal with China and have objectives, but to see everybody going in different, we don't have a comprehensive, let's put it together strategy. I, the legislation, which Chairman Menendez and I submitted and was passed, calls for bringing in a, an advisory panel of outside experts. It would include people probably from the Center for Strategic and International Studies, 
uh, from AEI, from Brookings, I mean, a whole range of individuals that would come in and offer ideas and suggestions, comprehensively put that together. If we do that, it's likely to, to exist beyond just one administration and becomes the, the basis for our strategy going forward. I strongly encourage the State Department to take the lead in making sure that we assemble that advisory board we lay out what would be included in a strategy. We consider the widest array of options uh, and that we actually put that together and ultimately brief uh, Chairman Menendez, Ranking Member Risch, and, and uh, others in the committee on that, that the strategy is, uh, that this process is being undertaken and what some of the conclusions are. It's, I, I think it's essential. I, I'm going to close off with that comment. I'm not going to ask for a response. You have to run to another briefing, and I'm not going to hold you up from doing that. But I, uh, I, I just want to underscore how critical it is that we go from ad hoc principles that we, and tactics that we apply from time to time to instead uh, fashioning, with the help of outside minds, a comprehensive series of options. We select the option that is our strategy. We move on that basis. Not doing so, in my opinion, will leave us um, in, in something less than the leadership position we so uh, desperately need to preserve our freedom and prosperity. If I may, Mr. Chairman. Um, Senator, we agree with you. Uh, we are, in fact, working on every one of those tactical areas that you identified, every single one. Bringing them together and doing the deep work on each one is incredibly time-consuming, but we are doing that work. The Secretary does have a Foreign Affairs Policy Board. We have an International uh, Security Board. Um, I will take back your idea that we have an ongoing China-focused uh, council, which we don't have a specific, though we do consult with outside consultants and outside experts on a constant basis. Uh, the secretary did so in his run-up to uh, the potential trip he was making to Beijing, which we postponed. But I think all of the areas that you laid out are absolutely ones on which we have to be laser-focused and bring together those tactics into an integrated strategy. That is what we are working on doing and having every single mission around the world have a bespoke strategy for their country because every country is different and China is present in every single one. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Deputy Secretary. Thank you. Well, well let me just uh, echo Senator Romney's uh, um, uh, view, which is why I joined with him in the amendment and which is why it is law now. Uh, so I think, uh, Madam Secretary, maybe one of the benefits of hearing your answer would be a more in, in detail uh, opportunity uh, to, in some briefing, to share with members who are interested about exactly how you're going about and the universe that is being uh, advised. So, so, so uh, I just want to echo Senator Romney's uh, concerns. Senator Paul has asked that his two letters that he referenced to be included in the record without objection. It shall, shall be included. Um, this uh, record will remain open to the close of business tomorrow. Uh, I'd urge uh, our witnesses to answer questions. I know I will have some that I did not get to um, uh, with some degree of specificity. With the thanks of the committee for both of your appearance here today and looking forward to seeing you at the intelligence briefing, this hearing is adjourned.